how you could possibly feel qualified to talk about any of this when you do this is just beyond me. What I've learned, it's this channel run by someone. If you look at his about tab, the email is Joseph something. So I'm going to call him Joseph. Uh, he does random videos that are supposed to be educational about various topics. I don't know if he has an expertise in anything in particular or how old he is or like anything about him, but he has talked about nutrition, I think a few times, often with a low carb uh, slant, if not just full on low carb, which is definitely what this recent video is supposedly answering the question if it is really a question of why ancient Egyptians were fat and sick. So he says just a lot, there's a lot in this video, actually not really that much. I mean, it's a long video, but it, anyway, it's, it's kind of in a disjointed way. So I've tried to um, group things together by, you know, theme or, or topic. Uh, yeah, so we'll start with the ancient Egyptian claim that ancient Egyptians ate mostly grains and that pharaohs were overweight and suffered from heart disease. It was found as early as 1911 that Egyptian mummies had heart disease. In fact, more than half of the 43 middle-aged mummies examined had heart disease. What was making them so sick? You can find several figurines depicting people grinding wheat, as well as art depicting people harvesting wheat or preparing bread. Egyptians with their bread-based diet were essentially following the 1991 USDA food pyramid. There's evidence of that, but it doesn't mean that all Egyptians ate the same things or in the same amounts. He tries to address this criticism by talking about stable isotope analysis. By looking at how much of an isotope of nitrogen, called nitrogen-15, is in the bones of a person or animal, and then comparing that to the nitrogen-15 content of plants in the area, they can tell whether an animal or person's diet had more meat or more plants in it. And as this paper explains, there was a surprising lack of difference in the stable isotope composition between social classes, meaning that everyone, rich or poor, was generally eating a high carb, low saturated fat diet. This is wrong in just so many ways. I don't I don't think he really understands what he's talking about here. So first, look at the the image that he shows. See how close cows are to grains? So the nitrogen ratio primarily reflects the source of nitrogen, aka protein. And there's not a big difference between beef fed on grains and grains themselves. Where the difference really lies is between the grains and animals farther down the food chain. So a peasant who's eating mostly grain and consuming smaller amounts of different meats, like diff meats that royalty aren't eating, could look very similar in terms of nitrogen ratio when compared to a pharaoh who's eating almost exclusively beef. As explained in the study, he references. So either he didn't read it or he did read it and he misunderstood we couldn't measure any differences with our methods as they ate exactly the same thing. <laughs> the point is you cannot draw strong conclusions about nitrogen sources from differences in nitrogen isotopes when there are confounding variables, which there absolutely were when we're talking about ancient Egyptians. The social classes were so different. Meaning that everyone, rich or poor, was generally eating a high carb, low saturated fat diet. Nitrogen sources say at least something about protein, but they say absolutely nothing about saturated fat when we're talking about sources like butter that don't have very much protein. Sources that some Egyptians, nobility, ate every day. So it's very likely the wealthier you were, the more saturated fat you consumed. Third, he's wrong about the most significant cause of obesity and heart disease, saying that it's what you eat, that it's the composition of your diet. That does matter. Obviously, saturated fat is a major contributor. Get to that in a minute. But it also matters how much you eat. It also matters how much activity you get. Pharaohs could have simply eaten more of the same things. You know, let's say they did eat the same exact diet as, you know, lower class as laborers. They didn't, but let's say they did. They could have just eaten more and ended up with same nitrogen ratios. They could have engaged in less physical activity, which is what we would expect when you're comparing royalty to, again, laborers. That's, that's kind of one of the perks. So basically he cherry picked one not even real imaginary example of a low meat diet being unhealthy. 
Why would he do that considering we have multiple contemporary examples of low meat diets that are pretty much the only epidemiological evidence we have to to show or to support a healthy diet pattern? Mediterranean, Okinawan, these are patterns that represent diets that are high in vegetables, grains, healthy plant fats, and lower in meats. Arguably the Seventh-day Adventists as well. Is this poor evidence? Yeah. There are a lot of social variables, you know, having strong family ties, uh, being physically active. Some kind of controlled study would be better, but it's what we have to go on. If you are going to argue against it, you better have some pretty good, pretty extensive evidence to back it up. This ain't it. Next, I'll talk about this anecdote that he brings up again and again and again throughout the video, along with um, kind of conspiratorial theories about medicine. This is a disease called ulcerative colitis, which a 71 year old man was suffering through. His health was pretty bad. He was also taking insulin and pills for his diabetes and high blood pressure. What's interesting about this man is the unconventional diet he used to actually put both his ulcerative colitis and diabetes into remission. Is it a meat based diet? He introduces this guy, Dr. Paul Mason, who he uh, shows, you know, clips of their little interview throughout the video. Dr. Mason says that current nutrition guidelines are not evidence-based. They can't be trusted. So let's look at the new diet that drastically improved the man's health. And we'll look at how it came to be that a medical professional, his endocrinologist, would recommend that he go back on the type of diet that probably made him sick in the first place. He stops just short of saying like big pharma <laughs> and claiming that doctors are like making you sick on purpose. Instead, he just implies that doctors are all like really stupid and just mindlessly following government recommendations, except for this one, of course. He also accuses the government of ignoring professionals and loading recommendations with grains in order to save money on food stamps. He references Dr. Louise Light. She is one of, or was one of the doctors who were hired by the government to create the, what ultimately became the food pyramid. According to her, their guidelines were largely ignored. They recommended three to four servings of grains, but the food pyramid, it ended up being six to 11 servings per day. So this is kind of true, but it leaves out a lot. So for one thing, Dr. Light's recommendations were not three to four servings of grains. They were three to four servings of whole grains. One of her big problems was not just the increase in grains, but it was that there was no distinction made between processed, refined grains and whole grains and really processed and fresh food in general. Also, increasing grains was not the only change. Low fat dairy and lean meat were downplayed to appease the you know, milk and meat lobbies. The meat lobby got the final word on the color of the saturated fat guideline, which was changed from red to purple because meat producers worried that using red to signify bad fat would be linked to red meat in consumers' minds. Meat, milk, and dairy have played a tremendous role in nutrition recommendations, and there's no credible evidence that the like whole grain lobby or whatever has slanted things away from meat and fat, as he implies in the video. In fact, the US government has bent over backwards to placate processed food and meat and dairy and egg industries, including by removing any mention of decreasing or cutting back on meat. The implication that government nutrition guidelines have been like pro-grain and anti-meat is just totally ahistorical. Only in the last few years have guidelines changed to the point where the USDA is actually recommending alternative forms of protein. And for those who don't know, the USDA doesn't use the pyramid anymore. They haven't for several years. Now they use the plate, which is leaps and bounds better. Everything I've read from like any dietitian is like, yeah, this is so much better. Um, I think Dr. Light would probably be much happier with this. Half of the plate should be fruits and vegetables. Half of your grains should be whole grains. And like I said, protein should include legumes, nuts, not just meat. It's actually very similar to the Harvard healthy eating plate. Anyway, back to the case study anecdote and his 
doctor's recommendations. Again, he was eating this meat diet that supposedly cured him. His endocrinologist recommended he go back on a high carb, reduced fat diet and limit his red meat consumption. So that's not quite right. We can see right here for ourselves that the doctor did not recommend low fat. He encourages nuts and olive oil. He suggests reduced fat dairy not reduced fat in general. Clearly the goal here, the doctor's goal, is to reduce saturated fat by replacing it with mono and polyunsaturated fat, not to just reduce fat generally. I don't know guys, maybe, maybe this guy's doctor knew more about the situation than this random quack and this random YouTuber. Maybe the doctor was worried about this meat and butter diet putting him at elevated risk for cardiovascular disease. The quote does mention high cholesterol, implying that the patient had high cholesterol. Or maybe some other reason or reasons that we don't know about because we aren't his doctor. Regardless, you won't be surprised to hear me say that just finding some anecdote, cherry picking an anecdote, is not impressive. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't tell us anything about general nutrition guidelines. Just because someone had positive results eating a meat and butter diet, it doesn't mean that we should all eat meat and butter. Just like, hey, there are some people who are allergic to peanuts. Should we all avoid peanuts? There are some people who are allergic to various meats. Should we all avoid meat? And even if this guy's dietary change correlated with a reduction or remission of his symptoms, that's not a miracle. Conditions like these can spontaneously reverse. It doesn't mean it has anything to do with eating large amounts of meat and butter. It's like believing the MMR vaccine causes autism because a kid was diagnosed with autism after receiving the vaccine. That's not science. And even if his remission was diet related, that still doesn't mean that it was the meat and butter aspect that made that happen. It's an extreme elimination diet, and maybe by going on that diet, by removing so many foods, maybe he ended up removing his trigger foods. Again, we have no idea. We are not experts, we're not his doctor, and it ultimately doesn't matter because it's one person, so it has nothing to do with general nutrition and health guidelines. Now we get into saturated fat and heart disease. More of this Dr. Paul Mason guy. He is an actual doctor. He is an actual MD. Uh, it seems like his specialty is more in like physiotherapy and sports medicine. So his expertise is certainly not in nutrition or cardiovascular disease or anything like that. Just, just making that clear because pretty much everything he is going to say, everything he says in the video goes against consensus. So... Yeah, that should be a pretty major red flag. Anyway, he's another low carb guy who doesn't believe in the lipid hypothesis. He says the recommendation that we should limit saturated fat in order to lower uh, disease risk is not based on evidence, that it's based on junk science, primarily Ansel Keys and the seven countries study. And this was based on uh, uh, some experimental data. For instance, what happens if you feed rabbits which are herbivorous? a uh, high saturated fat diet. So clearly this has no relevance for humans at all. Okay, so yeah, of course, rabbits developing heart disease does not mean that humans will, but it doesn't matter because no one is using that as evidence. And it's based on a epidemiological study, which has now been well and truly junked, uh, debunked, called the Seven Countries Study, where he basically cherry-picked data from some countries that he liked the results of. Nor are they using the Seven Countries Study alone as evidence. The lipid hypothesis is well established even if you completely ignore Keyes and his research. We have clinical reversal of heart disease via dietary changes. We have efficacy of statins at reducing cholesterol and numerous meta-analyses finding a positive correlation between saturated fat and cholesterol levels. Now that doesn't mean reducing saturated fat in your diet will lower your risk for CVD. And this is really the main issue, what you are replacing saturated fat with. Refined carbs? Nah, not so great. Nuts and seeds? Anyway, going back to Keys, uh, Joseph, the YouTuber, he shows these two graphs that you may have seen from other low carbers. It's supposed to be evidence of Keys. Uh, cherry picking in an attempt to show a positive correlation between fat intake and heart disease. When you look at the data for all 22 countries, there's no convincing relationship between fat and heart disease. That is not how any of this works. 
that you can't just draw squiggles everywhere and go, there's no correlation. There is clearly a correlation. It's not super duper strong, but there is clearly a trend here, clearly a positive correlation between calories from fat and heart disease deaths. Again, it's not super compelling, but who cares? No one is basing nutrition guidelines. No one is basing the link between saturated fat and cholesterol and heart disease on these studies. And this isn't even about saturated fat. It's about total fat. And again, the guidelines are not currently, they are not to eat low fat. They are to reduce saturated fat and ideally to replace that saturated fat with other fats. How you could possibly feel qualified to talk about any of this when you do this is just beyond me. The truth is, I, I think that he's just listening to people like Paul Mason to other low carbers who say this exact thing. I mean, this is why it's been debunked. This is why there is an entire paper on this and other nonsense theories and things that have just been regurgitated on the internet just over and over and over again. So now everyone involved in low carb just believes it without any knowledge of the actual sources. There's a whole paper on the seven country study and revisionist history because of videos like this. Regardless, four years later, a 1961 issue of Time magazine featured Ansel Keys. At the end of the article, it says Keyes' cholesterol was 209. That's funny because President Dwight Eisenhower had a much lower cholesterol of only 165 when he had his heart attack in 1955. And there are people who smoke and never get lung cancer. Like what? What is the point here? No one is saying that having lower cholesterol, total cholesterol or LDL makes you disease proof, makes you heart attack proof. It's a question of risk. If you have lower cholesterol, your risk is lower. If you have higher, your risk is higher. Unfortunately, there are other factors involved with this disease and virtually all diseases, typically multifactorial. So someone with low, with really good cholesterol can still have a heart attack. So if we were to take saturated fat, for instance, there's been more than 10 systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which is where we actually compile all the data together, looking at saturated fat and polyunsaturated fats. And on balance, they find in favor of saturated fats. Higher saturated fat consumption is not associated with worse health. Those have to do with population studies and actual dietary practice. The issue, again, is that in practice, industry often replace saturated fat, not with healthy things, but with sugar, even trans fats. I'm not saying that the link between saturated fat and heart disease in terms of like dietary practice, in terms of how we actually live is super strong. More and more, we're finding out that it's it's more complicated. It's the whole of what we're eating, all of the foods that we're eating, what we're replacing saturated fat with, how much we're eating. Eating high saturated fat, eating a bunch of processed carbs, too many calories, yeah, pretty bad. Eating moderate amounts of saturated fat, maybe even high amounts of saturated fat, along with a bunch of vegetables and fruit, and exercising, the vegetables, the exercise, etc., are likely to have at least some protective effect. That doesn't mean saturated fat is good for you. We don't need it, and it does increase blood cholesterol, so there is good reason to replace it with foods that don't. But in terms of just heart disease and in terms of the general public and guidelines, it probably makes more sense to focus on reducing processed foods and thereby reducing calories rather than focusing on saturated fats. Again, if we're only talking about heart disease and human health, obviously the animals would be super stoked if we all reduced our saturated fat intake. And now it's time to attack carbs, of course. Are there any consequences, you know, domino effects of this idea that you should not eat saturated fat? You shouldn't eat, you should cut this, the fat off your steaks. You shouldn't have full fat yogurt. You need to have skim milk. What are the downstream effects of that? Well, I mean, we've only got three main sources of macronutrients, which is, you know, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And you can only eat so much protein. I mean, it, it's, uh, and you cut out the fat in the diet, then that really leaves only one thing, and it means you have to increase your carbohydrate intake. So Joseph asked specifically about saturated fat, so it's really weird that this guy ended up answering just in terms of fat, generally, 
You absolutely do not have to increase your carb intake just because you are decreasing your saturated fat intake. Yeah, if you're decreasing fat, you're probably going to increase carbs. But again, he's talking about saturated fat. You can absolutely eat the same amount of fat, just different fat, polyunsaturated fats. You can even increase the amount of fat you consume even while decreasing the amount of saturated fat you consume. Again, consensus is that replacement of saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats lowers heart disease risk. Not that replacing saturated fat with carbohydrates, particularly refined carbohydrates, lowers risk. What most people don't realize is that carbohydrates are literally molecules of sugar joined together. Even the complex carbohydrates, you know, the brown rice, the sweet potato, the wholemeal bread, they are literally chains of glucose, sugar molecules joined together. So sugar is bad and chemically carbs are a chain of sugars. So carbs are bad? Is that the logic? Well, you know, wood is just like a bunch of little splinters all together. So like, don't, don't touch wood. Wood is bad. <laughs> what about glass? Glass is just a bunch of little silica stuck together and silica causes silicosis. So like glass is bad. <laughs> like everything around us can ultimately be broken down <laughs> into something that's harmful. If you break it down into just its component parts, it doesn't mean that the whole of it is harmful. Sugar accompanied by fiber in like an apple or whatever is a lot different than just granulated sugar. It's basic nutrition. It is consensus that refined carbs are unhealthy and whole carbs are healthy and they have an inverse correlation with type 2 diabetes. And when you ingest them, they get absorbed into your circulation. You end up with what we call elevated blood sugar levels. Again, basic nutrition. Not all carbs are the same in terms of glycemic index and glycemic load. Long-term and high levels of carbohydrate consumption we know are causally associated with a condition called insulin resistance, which eventually leads to diabetes. It's funny how high these people's bars for causality are when it comes to saturated fat, but then when it comes to sugar, just just so low, you, you can't even see it. Since Joseph, the uh, YouTuber, used this as a source earlier in the video, I'm going to assume that he finds it credible. Interestingly, it says, though we know sugar doesn't directly cause type 2 diabetes, you are more likely to get it if you are overweight. You can gain weight when you take in more calories than your body needs, and sugary foods and drinks contain a lot of calories. So you can see if too much sugar is making you put on weight, then you are increasing your risk of getting type 2 diabetes. But type 2 diabetes is complex and sugar is unlikely to be the only reason the condition develops. So no, we do not know that sugar causes type 2 diabetes. There are some proposed mechanisms, but if there is an actual effect, they're so overshadowed by the effect of weight gain that the signal isn't apparent through the noise. And also you're just as capable of becoming obese on saturated fat as you are on sugar. Excess calories are excess calories. And what's the problem in diabetes? Well, everybody knows, right? It's having excess glucose, this particular type of sugar, in the bloodstream. And when we eat more carbohydrate, we put more sugar in the bloodstream. That sugar's gotta come from somewhere, right? So if I explain this to most of my patients, you know, they'll often look at me and say, so why don't I just stop eating carbohydrate? And you know what? That is the solution. It's, it's really that simple. This is uh, treating diabetes 101. If you already have diabetes, it might be a good idea to limit carbohydrates and to limit you know, yourself to lower glycemic carbohydrates. But what really works in the long term is weight loss and restoring insulin sensitivity. And virtually any diet can do that. For some people, low carb wor works really well. For some people, low fat works really well. As the American Diabetes Association says, there's not one diet or meal plan that works for everyone with diabetes. If you're overweight and a particular diet helps you lose weight, it will probably help you manage your diabetes. You see the same bullshit with low fat, high carb people, right? Except for them, it's fat that causes diabetes and not sugar. Everybody wants that their macronutrient, the, the, the one that they demonize, that's the cause of whatever, but that's just, that's not, what the evidence says. This concept that carbohydrates are made of glucose, they cause a rise in our blood sugar, therefore they're not good for us, is beyond the grasp of most doctors. Or maybe most doctors aren't mature enough not to view nutrition and diabetes in such simplistic and childish terms. 
Maybe most doctors understand that such a diet is very, very restrictive and it excludes a lot of healthy foods for no reason. And that maybe their patients would have a really hard time adhering to such a restrictive diet. Maybe. Is there a, a biological requirement for dietary carbohydrate? So I will say right now, and I'll say it explicitly, there is no need for dietary carbohydrate. In other words, the theoretical minimal consumption of carbohydrate that is consistent with good health is zero. It's zero if you don't mind staying in ketosis forever. <laughs> I mean, we don't really have the research on that. We don't know if that is compatible with good health long term, even uh, you know, vegan keto that limits saturated fat, which you, you can't do, it's difficult, but you can do, even that could have like complications on bodily organs in the long term. All we have is circumstantial evidence and every case in which non-human animals or human animals have eaten very low carbohydrate diets, they have evolved not to go into ketosis. Like cats, they use gluconeogenesis, which is the conversion of protein into glucose for fuel. Now, this could just be because it's more efficient. You know, maybe it has nothing to do with damaging organs or anything like that. It could just have to do with efficiency, but we don't know for sure. Unlike with strict plant-based diets, there is no animal on this planet that exists long-term in ketosis. This is not just like the same nutrients from different sources, which is what like veganism is. It's a fundamentally different mechanism of metabolism that typically you, you only enter in like emergency situations, right? During starvation or disease. I just think that needs to be talked about a little bit more by people who are promoting keto. Everyone else talks about that. <laughs> All the mainstream sources talk about that, but anyone who is promoting keto, not so much. And now we get to typical anti-plant fear mongering that you've probably heard a million times before. First is fiber, that it's not actually good for you, that it doesn't actually treat constipation. In fact, he says a low fiber diet treats constipation. And then he mentions that one study that all low carb carnivore people inevitably bring up whenever they're talking about fiber and how bad it is. This study where people with idiopathic constipation eating a high fiber diet who stopped or reduced dietary fiber had significant improvement in their symptoms, while those who continued on a high fiber diet had no change. So people with idiopathic constipation, idiopathic just means they don't know the cause of it. Um, people with idiopathic constipation who were still struggling on a high fiber diet, then being moved to a reduced or even like no fiber, zero fiber diet, having improvements, that means that no one needs fiber? Clearly that is not what the study says. It's an interesting study and it seems that people are right to question the significance of fiber for constipation, given that it only seems to be useful in cases where people are actually fiber deficient, they're actually eating a low fiber diet. But obviously none of this can be generalized to the rest of us, to the non-constipated public right? Especially considering all of the evidence in favor of fiber. It's clearly not evidence against constipation. Uh, but you know, we, we can't be too surprised seeing as we're dealing with a doctor who fundamentally doesn't understand constipation. What is constipation? So effectively, constipation is trouble passing fecal matter. You're trying to pass something through a small hole. So is it really logical that making that something bigger is going to make it easier to path through a small hole. This is just so embarrassing. This might be the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen in any video I've ever responded to. Constipation is not caused by the hole, like our anuses being too small. It's caused by a lack of movement in the muscles that propel waste, poop, out of our body. If you've ever been constipated, like, you know, it's not large, soft poops. It's, it's like... It's pretty small, like hard poops that eventually there's enough of so they get, you know, mashed together and your body can finally push it out. <laughs> it's a matter of, of mass. There needs to be enough. It needs to be large enough that your body, that your muscles can push against it and push it out of your body. Like this is basic shit. 
Anyway, then we get back to Joseph, who says that we shouldn't expect a high fiber diet to be the norm for humans because of evolution. So we should expect it to be like actually bad for us or not optimal. Um, he's talking about the expensive tissue hypothesis or the, you know, meat made us human, meat gave us our big brains, that sort of thing. It's actually not a very compelling hypothesis. There is not a strong correlation between animal's brain and gut sizes. There are plenty of exceptions and there are even pretty rigorous analyses disproving it. Again, interesting how low the bar for causality is when it supports his narrative. We've often put plants up on a pedestal as being uniquely nutritious and uniquely healthy. And yet plant, they do contain things like oxalates and uh, phytates and tannins and things that actually impair nutrient absorption. They're literally called anti-nutrients and they can cause these other problems uh, within the body. Anti-nutrients of various kinds do bind to certain nutrients, but some of them may actually be like health promoting. And the presence of these says nothing about the whole of the food. The plants we eat contain far more nutrients than just what is bound to phytic acid or whatever. And we know that gluten actually increases what we call intestinal permeability in everybody. Now, people with celiac disease are more susceptible to the side effects because of uh, the degree of intestinal permeability that they already start with. Um, but everybody is vulnerable to these. There's no evidence that gluten is harmful to you if you don't have celiac disease, which is an immune response. The increased permeability may make that worse, but if you don't have the underlying immune response, there's no evidence that normal people experience any adverse symptoms as this guy claims. And there's no evidence that celiac disease is caused by leaky gut or even that leaky gut syndrome exists. But plants do have substances in them that not everyone can handle. You wouldn't give wheat bread to a celiac patient. You wouldn't give a peanut to someone with a peanut allergy. And you wouldn't give chicken or pork or beef to people who are allergic to chicken or pork or beef. Like, no food is appropriate for every single person on the planet. Like, what is even the point of this? Some people are very sensitive to something called oxalates. Oxalates are compound found in many plant foods, for example, leafy greens. Dietary oxalates are perfectly fine for most people, just in normal quantities. You don't need to absorb 100% of the nutrients you eat, like to be healthy or even for like optimal quote unquote health. We don't have unlimited needs for nutrients and more is not inherently better. The only plausible negative effect of a diet that's very large or very heavy in oxalates is kidney stones. Some people do seem more susceptible. I talked about that recently, but there are a lot of ways to help mitigate that even when eating relatively large amounts of high oxalate greens. Oxalate poisoning is actually something farmers have to deal with. They have to prevent their herds from eating too many oxalate containing plants. The animals can develop issues as serious as kidney failure from this. Humans are told that the brassica kale is a superfood. But ranchers caring for a herd of grazing animals are told to beware of the health risks of kale. We aren't ruminants though, so like, what? I mean, it's really weird considering the whole rabbit thing earlier, like criticizing people for supposedly, even though they're not, relying on studies on rabbits when making guidelines or when talk for human health or when talking about human health, but then, but then you have this, like, what is this video? Anyway, these are the amounts of oxalate in some high oxalate forages. Kale contains something like 17 milligrams per 100 grams. In terms of dry mass, that's about 0.1%. Not only is it comical to compare kale to the leafy plants on that list, but our digestive systems work very differently from ruminants, grazing animals who are adapted to low nutrient density grasses with enteric fermentation in multiple stomachs. That's not us. The point is to say that we shouldn't expect all people to be perfectly able to handle all plants. Good, because literally nobody expects that. When we actually have a look at um, a lot of the nutrients in plant foods, we have to have a look at biological value. So if we take iron, for instance, we get heme iron from uh, animal foods and we get non-heme iron from plant-based foods like spinach. But there's really no comparison in terms of how effective they are able to be utilized by the body. There are literally comparisons though. 
There are sites like veganhealth.org, which is run by a registered dietitian, that covers that in detail and how to improve absorption of non-heme iron sources. So non-heme iron in spinach is, uh, is very difficult for our body to actually assimilate and to deal with. Spinach is unusually high in oxalates compared to other vegetables that we eat, but even it is a good source of iron, particularly when prepared correctly. So like not eaten raw. I mean, you can eat spinach raw if you want, but like if you're using that as an iron source, maybe cook it first and eat some beans. We're often told this or that fruit or vegetable is chock full of this or that nutrient. Leafy greens have folate and calcium. Carrots have choline. Avocados have vitamin B6. Beans have iron. Nuts have zinc. Mushrooms have riboflavin. That's great, but an egg yolk has all of those. Interestingly, he doesn't mention vitamin C. Wonder why that is. Whether or not this or that food, talking about one food, has this or that nutrient isn't really important unless you're eating that food and that food alone or you're eating just a very, very restrictive diet. Most of us eat a varied diet, even vegans among us, so it doesn't really matter if one food has a bunch of vitamin A and another food doesn't. That's why we're all encouraged, vegan or not, to eat a balanced diet, to eat a variety of foods. The more types of food that you avoid, the harder it's going to be to meet nutrient requirements. For example, people often think carrots are a good source of vitamin A because they refer to the beta carotene in carrots as vitamin A. But the reality is that that beta carotene needs to be converted in the human body into vitamin A. This always tickles me when like pro-meat, anti-vegan, whatever, these types of carnivore people, they always say this like it's some sort of secret knowledge. Like, no, we, yeah, we know, we know the difference between preformed and pro vitamin A, like pro vitamin A, like beta carotene has to be converted in the body. It's why when you look up daily recommended about amounts, it's often given in RAE, retinol activity equivalent, which takes into account conversion rates. <laughs> so weird. So take a look at my mom's blood test. Her beta carotene level is very high, where her vitamin A is actually in the low range. What's going on? You used a really old, outdated source, or you made it up. Seriously, I have no idea where he got this from, but these reference ranges are totally wrong. For beta carotene, the normal range is 50 to 300 micrograms per deciliter, not 3 to 91, so 162 totally normal. And for vitamin A, it's 15 to 60 or 20 to 60, not 36.4 to 108. So again, totally normal. To wrap up the vitamin A stuff, there are plenty of plants with high amounts of vitamin A, carrots and sweet potato, pumpkin, kale, broccoli. It has to be converted, but there's so much in there that it's, it's not a problem. And also, unlike with animal sources of vitamin A, there's no risk in consuming too much. You cannot get enough or too much beta carotene from food sources. Even with genetic variability, with conversion rates of pro-vitamin A to preformed vitamin A, there's no reason to think that, again, carrots, for instance, aren't a good source. You would need actual evidence to prove that, not some random person's blood work, even if that blood work weren't totally normal, which it is, this video sucks. We've got in our head that plant-based foods are more nutrient-dense and essentially more nutritious than other foods, and if we don't have a side of vegetables or fruit on our plate, then we must be missing out. Um, the, the simple fact is that's not the case. Animal foods are more nutrient-dense than plant-based foods. First, plant foods are the only foods that contain phytonutrients. Second, animal foods are more dense in terms of like most other nutrients, but they're also more calorie dense. If you're starving, that's probably a good thing. But if you live in the developed world where, you know, obesity, heart disease are more of a concern, then like, yeah, you might, you might be more concerned with calories. If you're looking to optimize nutrients per calorie, in most cases, vegetables are gonna be a better bet. And again, the animals and the planet would very much appreciate us sticking with plants. So that's the video. The comments are equally depressing. Like everyone I saw was fine. There was no criticism. Like there were very few downvotes. It's pretty crazy. You know, this is a channel with 
well over a million subscribers. The video has over a hundred thousand views, it's reaching a lot of people, and it is just full of misinformation. It's kind of mind boggling. Not that I haven't seen this type of thing before. I mean, I just talked about another YouTuber who says all sorts of wrong things in her video, but even that is different. Like she's a vlogger and even though she's like, I'm not an expert and then she says things very authoritatively, it's, it's still a lot different than this where it is high production, all this stock footage and interviewing this doctor. Like that is a whole different level of look how professional this is and believe what I say. And yeah, it's, it's, it's hard not to be just like, I don't know, demoralized by that, I guess. This is the problem with the internet. This is the problem with YouTube in particular, I think. Someone like this and someone like me, let's be real, like we would never have a platform on TV. <laughs> like if it weren't for YouTube, we would not have a platform. This guy would not really have a voice anywhere because I mean, he's clearly not any sort of expert. I'm sure he would say that if he were, right? People like this and people like me, you know, again, who don't have any expertise, I'm sitting here like trying to debunk this guy and relying on experts. But in reality, it would be better if the 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 loudest voices were actual experts, <laughs> like actual dietitians and researchers and, you know, so I don't know. That's it, I guess. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, <laughs> subscribe, support the channel, patreon.com slash unnatural vegan. Hopefully I will have a new video soon. I recorded a what I ate today yesterday. So maybe I'll have that up soon. And I don't know. I'm trying to think of something positive, but like, it's so late. I got to go. So just, I hope, I hope you had a good week and I hope you have an even better week to come. Okay.